at this point, she have some feeling for the mechanics of antiderivatives and indefinite integrals. The next step is to connect these ideas to the graph of the function. Now, for instance, the connection from the derivative to the graph of the function is going to be through slopes of tangent lines. For integration, the connection is going to be area under the graph of the function. Now, for the derivative, slope of the tangent line is pretty much what we use as a definition. For integration, we have to do a little bit of work to connect that idea to area. So that's going to be our first step. So how do we get the area of an object in the plane? OK, so the method we're going to use is exhaustion. So this idea goes back to the ancient Greeks. What we're going to do, we have a complicated region in the plane. We're going to fill it up with simple regions. OK, and those simple regions will know how to take their area. So the idea is going to be, as you let the simple regions get smaller and smaller, you could fill the complicated region up with more and more of them. When you take the area of those simple regions, add them up, that's going to give you an approximation for the complicated region's area. Then, as you take the limit, as the size goes to zero, if that limit exists, you can call that the area of your complicated region. Now, we're going to take that idea, apply it to the area under the graph of a function between two points. So here's our picture. So we draw in our graph, and then we're going to mark off two points, and then the simple regions that we use to fill up our complicated region are just going to be rectangles. So the idea is going to be, as we let our rectangles get smaller and smaller, so that'll be by letting the bases get thinner and thinner, you'll note that the gaps at the top are also going to get smaller and smaller. So if our function's nice, as we let those bases go down to zero, we take the sum of the areas of the rectangles, take the limit, that should go to the area of the region. For a concrete example, let's consider f of x equal to 1 plus x. Then I want the area under the graph of our function and above the interval from 1 to 2. Here, our region is going to be a trapezoid, so I could figure out the area precisely. Okay, we'll get two and a half. So that's going to be the check in our work when we get our final answer. Now, let's do an approximation with 10 rectangles, each having equal length base. Note, okay, the total length of our base is going to be 2 minus 1, so it's going to be equal to 1, and then we're going to divide by 10, so we can fit 10 rectangles in there. So our base length is going to be 0.1. We'll call that delta x, okay, since we're going along the x-axis. Now, we're going to take our graph, fill it in with 10 rectangles that are underneath the graph. So we'll call our rectangles inscribed rectangles, and then the approximation is going to be called the lower sum. Now, we need the base and the height so we can get the area of each rectangle. We already have the base. Length of the base is going to be 0.1. You note, each height is going to be on the graph. Okay, So we're looking for function evaluated at an endpoint. In this case, to get our rectangles underneath the graph, we're always using the left endpoints. So we're going to start at 1, and then we just keep moving by 0.1. Now, note we want 10 rectangles. So to get 10, we're going to start with 1, go to 1.1, and then go all the way up to 1.9. So we don't use 2. Now, to get the heights, we just apply our function to each of our left endpoints. So it's going to give me 2, 2.1, all the way up through 2.9. Now, if we want the area of the rectangle, we multiply by the length of the base. It's going to be multiplying by 0.1. So I'll get 0 0.2, 0 0.21, all the way up through 0.29. And then when we sum the areas, we're going to get 2.45. So that's just shy of the actual area, which is 2.5. And that's believable because you'll note we have little gaps above each rectangle. So we have an underestimate. Now, how about if we use n rectangles with equal length base? This might seem unmanageable, but it's really just an exercise in bookkeeping. 
first, our rectangles have equal length base. So if I want to fit n of those into an interval of length 1, so we're going from 1 to 2, that means each has to have base 1 over n. So that's going to be my delta x. Now, the next step, we want to find the left endpoints. So if we apply the function to the left endpoints, that guarantees that a rectangle is under the graph of our function. So same as before, we find our first point. OK, that's going to be 1. And I just keep adding our delta x. So we'll have 1, 1 plus 1 over n, 1 plus 2 over n. And then we go all the way up to 1 plus n minus 1 over n. OK, we know we end there. If I add 1 over n to that, we're going to get 2 which would mean we've gone one too far. So we stop here. Next step, we apply our function to our left endpoints to get the height of each rectangle. So if I do that, it's the same as adding one to each left endpoint. So we'll have two, two plus one over n, two plus two over n, two plus n minus one over n. Finally, to get the area of the rectangle, I multiply by one over n. Okay, the length of the base. So that's going to give us 2 over n, 2 over n plus 1 over n squared, 2 over n plus 2 over n squared, all the way up through 2 over n plus n minus 1 over n squared. I want to take those areas and then sum. Now we have n rectangles. So if we take the first term in each sum, it's going to be n times 2 over n. It's going to give me a 2. For the second term in each sum, Note, I could factor out a 1 over n squared. So we'll do that. Then we'll be left with 1 plus 2 plus 3, all the way up through n minus 1. Now, that's an arithmetic sum. So we can go and look that up. And then the answer is going to be, OK, you take your n minus 1, you add 1, so it gives you an n, you multiply, and then you divide by 2. So this gives us the formula for the area when we use n rectangles with equal length base. It's going to give us 2 plus 1 half n minus 1 over n. Now, that's not very enlightening, but if we take the limit as n goes to infinity, what happens? This term here is going to go to 1. So n minus 1 over n, as you go to infinity, goes to 1. And that's going to give us an area equal to 2 and a half, which agrees with the actual area for the trapezoid. As a final note, we introduce some notation and definitions. First, sigma notation. Here, we're going to take a consecutive list of integers. We'll apply a function to each integer, and then we're going to take the sum. So for instance, start with 3 squared plus 4 squared, all the way up through 15 squared. Here, our consecutive list is going to be 3 through 15. Our function is going to be the squaring function. Now, sigma notation is going to give me a convenient way to write that out. So we'll start with a big sigma, so sigma for sum. Our range goes from 3 in the bottom to 15 up in top. Our variable is going to be i, which we also put in the bottom. And then we'll have our function i squared. So the way we read this, this says, take the sum as i goes from 3 to 15 of i squared. So we're taking each number between 3 and 15, squaring it, and then taking the sum. Now, you can see how this would be useful in the process that we're doing from before. So there we were taking sums of areas of rectangles. Next definition, partition of an interval. So if the interval a, b, Partition is just going to be some subset of A, B, of finitely many points. That includes A and B. So the idea here, we'll start with our point A. We'll have finitely many points in order. And then we're going to finish on the point B. So what's happening here? Let's take a look at our example from before, the interval going from 1 to 2. We divide that into 10 equal pieces. So the partition there was, OK, start with 1. So we had 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, all the way up to 2. So in general, a partition doesn't have to be uniformly spaced. Okay, You're just going to take any old subset of points 
that contains your endpoints. Now, the idea is, okay, when I have a partition, that's gonna tell you the bases of the rectangles and the process from before. So that leads us to the idea of a Riemann sum of a function for a given partition. So we want to take the process that we had before, approximating an area using rectangles, and then generalize as much as we can. So the first generalization, we can use any old partition to get the bases of our rectangles. So if our partition isn't evenly spaced, that's just fine. That just means the rectangles will have bases of unequal length. Next generalization, for the heights, we take our function, we're just gonna apply it to some point in the interval. So we don't need to insist on applying it to an endpoint of your interval. Finally, we don't need to insist on f being positive either. So f can take on negative values. So if you think about what's happening there, okay, if f is negative, then the rectangle that goes with that will be below the x-axis, and in that case, you're gonna be considering a negative area, okay? as much as that makes sense. We'll see some examples of that in a little bit. 